Greetings and salutations, everyone, and I hope everyone is still doing well and enjoying today's happy 4th, the 4th of July, America's birthday. I got some awesome bonus encounters and a Q&A from Victor. Before we get into it, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. Finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, Simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button. It takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the exciting and informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things, they help this channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with today's bonus, shall we? Today's first part of the upload is a subscriber encounter. First, let me start off by saying our property is only a few acres in Taylor, Mississippi. We've had the property for about 50 years, I believe. My grandfather at the time was a handyman doing odd jobs for people and worked in the town's grocery store. At the time, my grandfather was 22. He would get up at 4 a.m. to walk to work two or three miles each way, since he didn't own a vehicle. He did this every day for three years. Then he met my grandmother, and they started dating, so when he would get off work, he would head to her house, which was a mile the opposite direction. Like any other day, he would leave her house at two hours before it got dark. As he would head home, he would cut through a trail that would cut his trip down by one and a half miles. One evening, he was heading home, cutting through the trails he took many times before. He was about a mile into the woods, and he felt something was off, as if he was being watched. So as he is walking, he heard something in the distance moving. He stopped. It stopped as well, and it's getting dark, and he has no type of other light other than his matches. So he started to rip a piece of his shirt off and put some dry leaves in it. He tied it to a nice-sized stick and took some tree sap and applied there as well. While this is going on, the sound of something approaching got louder. As it was only a few yards away, and it's almost completely dark, he attempted to light his makeshift torch. He was down to his last four matches. Darkness fell upon him. He was able to get it lit, and it began to blaze. It lit up the whole area around him. Standing twenty feet from him was this monster, eight feet tall, a head three times the size of any wolf known to man. Its mouth was overcrowded with teeth. Arms long past its knees, it had backwards legs, dark gray in color and a pissed off look. It looked like it had gotten wronged, and it was going to rip him to shreds with evil intent. He stood there looking at the demon, fingers over-exaggerated with three-inch nails. Then it let out a horrific growl as saliva dripped from its mouth, as if it had rabies. It charged at him, taking a swipe. He was able to get out of the way and press the torch to the side, burning it badly, and its fur caught fire. It screamed in pain, the sounds of a woman being butchered and a dog. He took off running for thirty minutes, lung burning, breathing hard and labored. He had a quarter of a mile left, and he was not going to make it, and his torch was almost out. He was able to extend the longevity of the torch as he was resting, trying to Catch his breath, a few minutes went by and he heard this roar in the distance and the creature was bulldozing his way towards him. He takes off in full effect, running for his life and sees his house in the distance. The creature is closing his gap and he accepts the fact that he is about to die. Tears pouring down his face, he yelled for his dad with everything he had before he collapsed from exhaustion. He came to, finding himself in his house. 
His father was in the kitchen at the window facing the woods. His hunting rifle was always at the door. When he heard his son, he saw a light and a body on the ground and a massive animal less than 15 yards away closing in. Without thinking, he grabbed his rifle and fired two shots, shattering the window at the creature, hitting it in the shoulder, quickly chambering another round and hitting it in the chest, causing it to flee back into the woods. That is the first encounter my family had. This subscriber from Taylor, Mississippi has um, contacted me yesterday and he sent me his grandfather's first encounter. Apparently there are more. He's going to send them to me uh, periodically. Um, he said he's got a few of them. So that was the first of the batch and definitely a scary one. Today's second subscriber encounter. Hey Jeff, thank you for taking your time to hear my encounter. Zach is my name and you can use it, that's fine with me. I'm 29 now and this happened when I was 9, maybe 10. But before I get into that, I want to give you a small layout of the property and small details of the house. My mom's parents used to have a mid-sized two-story home with 30 to 40 acres of land in Somerdale, Alabama. Had a lot of farm animals, chickens, peacocks, horses, roosters, you name it. The backyard had pecan trees and an old barn it used to keep the horses in. It was old and a tin roof on it. Why I give you this info on the barn will lead up to what I'm about to share. One weekend I decided I wanted to stay the night with my grandparents, as I usually do once or twice a month. My mom and dad were no longer together, so I had to share my time between the two, so when I did stay with my mom, I would always want to go see my grandparents. So one weekend, I stayed the night. I just finished up with a late night snack and was going back into the kitchen to put my dirty dish away and get ready for bed. Now in the kitchen, there's a window above the sink with a light on above the window. At first, I saw movement in the corner of my eye, so I looked out of the window. I couldn't see in one of the trees. The peacocks were acting up, flying out of the tree they usually slept in. So I go outside, thinking maybe they were spooked by something. Maybe an owl or they saw a coyote, so I grab my BB gun and a flashlight and go out. My grandparents were already upstairs getting ready for bed, and my grandpa was on his breathing machine. So, me being the only male, I told him I'm going outside to see why the peacocks were acting up. He told me to hurry back inside, it's late and bedtime, so I had told him no problem. So I go outside and go out the back door, which is a glass sliding door. I walk out, usually the dog, whose name is Jake, he's a great Dane and was my best friend, usually would be at the door. And if he wasn't, he would come running, but this time he didn't. I was concerned there's a light near the barn, so the backyard was lit up pretty decent. Well, I call for Jake and nothing. After I call his name, I heard movement in the tree next to the barn. That was also close to the tree, so I turned on my flashlight and began to slowly walk into the backyard. Now, usually, Jake would come running for me by now, so I call out to him again and nothing. I stopped talking and began to worry, thinking something's happened to him, and tears began to roll down my face. After a few minutes, I realized the peacocks are all on the ground. They were normally in the trees, sleeping. Then I hear a rooster flopping around like a madman in the same tree they would all sleep in, then nothing. It was dead. At this point, all the animals were scattered and running. This was not right. I was telling myself I've never seen or heard anything like this. I'm standing here confused, fear just filling my body, and... I don't know why I yelled for my dog Jake, and this time I see him about 50 yards come running from the other side of the barn. I go walk up to him and he runs past me and runs into the old green house that my grandma uses for her flowers. This is when I realize something is not right. Then I hear this deep growl and I'm struck with fear. I can't move, I can hardly breathe. At this point I turn around. I can't move like I'm frozen in a block of ice. The flashlight and the BB gun are still in my hands and I can't lift them. I can't understand what's going on. 
Finally, I'm able to turn, and when I do, I don't see anything. I turn the light on to my flashlight, and I'm looking around. Nothing. Man, I'm starting to tear up as I type this. So I keep looking, and then I hear a noise in the tree, and I shine my light to see, and that's when I see it. About 20 to 30 feet in the tree at first, all I saw was a white grayish hump. Then it began to move, and now I see what now I could tell was a back and shoulders. Then it's right ear. I'm freaking out as this is too big to be anything like a coyote. As it finishes to turn, I see its face. If you've ever seen the werewolf of Fever Swamp on Goosebumps, this thing's face looked like that werewolf's face. As I shine the light on it, it looks at me with these yellow eyes. My body is stiff as a board, and I felt so empty on the inside. This thing lifted its left arm, and in its left hand had one of the dead roosters. As it does this, it continues to look at me. I'm shaking, and as I'm looking, my light goes out. That's when I snap out of it and begin beating the light to come on. As I do this, I hear that growl once again. I look up. I barely can see it. It begins to shift its body, completely facing me. I hit the light once more, this time on my thigh, and it came back on. I shine it up back onto this thing, and it's looking at me with this grin on its face. When I say grin, I mean the Grinch who stole Christmas grin. That's when I aim my BB gun. What made me do this, I don't know, but as soon as I do this, this thing jumps from the tree onto the roof of the barn, and it's a tin roof. When it landed, it sounded like someone dropped a load of bricks at once. Just a big god-awful boom. Then it hits the ground, and at this point, there's nothing. I'm shining my light all around. I'm still frozen in fear. As I want to walk closer to look, but I can't, then I hear this heavy breathing. That turns into a growl. This growl I felt like was rattling my insides to pieces. I'm shining my light all around the barn, through the doorway, to the rooftops, and I can't see it, but that's when I shine it to the side of the barn. That's straight in front of me, and that's when I see this thing's left hand and left side of its face just looking at me. Then it ducks back behind the barn. I begin to back up, knowing this isn't right. This can't be real. As I begin to back up, it pops its head and hand out again. This time it puts its hand on the barn, and then it completely steps out from behind it, standing on two legs with this evil grin. I'm so scared I begin to cry out of control. I have no control over my body. I can't move. I'm trying to scream, but my mouth won't open. That's when I see that it lift its right arm and waves at me. I know nobody's going to believe this, but I swear on my own family's lives it waved at me as I'm seeing this wave and lies the dead rooster on the ground and then runs still on two legs. With what Info William has given us, it's helped me to get this out. But after it ran off and I go back inside and run to my room, my grandparents asked me what was wrong. I told them that I saw a monster. They wouldn't have believed me if I told them what I saw, and to this I've hardly told anyone. And the one I've told just blew me off as a little kid that was afraid of the dark. With all of the info that's been given on your channel, I do believe this was a werewolf. Werewolves are intelligent ones and have yellow eyes. And with it being in color, it's possible it had been a female, as William has stated that females are usually the ones that got color besides black. I hope this encounter is easy to make out and understand I'm not the best writer, and this is the first time really telling it, and it's been 20 years since that encounter. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Zach. I really appreciate that. I know it was hard to hold in and finally get out. Hopefully hearing this on my channel, it helps you a little more. Today's third part will be some Q&A from William. Cryptids Roost asks, The facts are interesting, William. With the added 32 months you've had to sign up on, 
Will anyone still be after you, as Sebastian forewarned about watching your back, or was that all to do with your former CO? I believe that had to do with my former CO. I'm hoping there's only one man above me at this time, and he is the one that removed my former CO. SG Max asks, Question, Has there been any time where any of the big three have worked together with humans in the wild outside of the government ops? This is the only story I was told by my dad, so I believe it to be true myself. But in April or May of 1980, when Mount St. Helen blew her top and side off, there were thousands of wild game killed. Bear, deer, elk, all kinds of wild game. I believe around 50 to 60 people were killed in 11 states that the ash covered. But at the mountain site, he said, they set up tents at one location for something special. A couple of very large men that only moved around at night with a doctor and someone said they were treating 18 more patients like the two big men that were only seen at night. But finally, they all gave in to their injuries and died, but they were supposed to be working for the government in some capacity. This is my interjection or just brief thing on that. Um, I remember probably six years ago, uh, I was doing something, I was watching, I don't think it was on the computer, I think it was a TV show or something. But I remember when Mount St. Helen erupted that there were uh, National Guard and um, troops with their green tents set up. And for some reason, I vaguely remember the mention of Sasquatch. Um, it just stuck in, it popped in my head just moments as I was reading that so i just wanted to share that with you guys excellent lord god asks i was curious if there has been any future plans for darting and implanting the wild dog man and werewolf population at this time there are no plans to start any such program actually we have new orders to continue breeding them through 2024 as it stands right now shane barber asks question for william is there any way to make peace with them, or should we just stay away from them? We never go out beyond the small field, and we stay close to our home. We often see a small Sasquatch walking, watching us, and the tall one seems to be protecting us. I pray they never harm us. Shane, if you are sure it's a dogman and a Bigfoot, don't worry. The Bigfoot will not leave that area, and the dogman will. The Bigfoot will not tolerate it being inside his territory for long. Then he will force it out or worse, kill it. So go and enjoy yourself. You're not in harm's way if you have a small child. They are safe to go outside as well. If you wanted something to alarm you, to danger, get yourself a dog. Get a mutt from the dog pound. Don't go and get a purebred dog. You want something like a junkyard dog, a mid-sized dog. You don't want something that will stand and fight you. You want something that will bark and yelp and draw attention to itself. That way, these creatures won't go after your pet or you because they may be seen by others with all of the noise going on. Christina Weller asks, A few questions for William. Do you know anything about Anubis, the Egyptian god of death, mummification, embalming, the afterlife, cemeteries, tombs, and the underworld in ancient Egyptian religion, usually depicted as a canine or a man with a canine head? If so, do you know if he was a werewolf? Or, if so, are werewolves descendants of Anubis? Does Sebastian know his history? Were werewolves capable of speaking before they were taught English? Do or did they have their own language? What do you know of the Nephilim and their possibility of being alive still to this day and hunted by government? Any chance you could tell me how many dogmen or werewolves are in or around Bates County, Missouri, specifically Amsterdam or Moret, Missouri? 
My curiosity is so thirsty now. Yes, I have a great knowledge of Anubis and all he is connected to and the Egyptian religion. Is there a specific question you are asking here? I don't think that the werewolf is a direct descendant of Anubis. When I did talk with Sebastian about history of the werewolf, I do not remember him speaking anything about Anubis, but I have promised to ask him about this again as soon as I get clearance to go back down into the enclosures again. Yes, he knows it, and it's quite lengthy. Just as soon as possible, I will get him to tell it to me again, and he will share it back to everyone while it's still fresh in my mind. It's been many years since we spoke of this, and I don't like to give out bad info and have to correct what I say, so please just let me talk with him again, and I know I'll tell you. I'm sure they do, but we encourage them to speak, so... We can't understand them, so we won't feel threatened and endangered by how we perceive them to be talking to one another. The Nephilim are alive today, I would not think so. And as for countries hunting it, maybe in the 60s and 70s, but no one to my knowledge these days would put resources into trying to find a Nephilim. Maybe some private individuals may still be looking. Now, Christina, you know I can't tell you numbers, but you don't need to be outside after dark walking your dog unless you are armed and can use it. Anthony Fletcher's statement. Hey, William, there is a real good ammo company called Underwood Ammo. They have some shells called Extreme Penetrator. Just thought you might want to check it out. Hey, Anthony, thanks for the info. I really appreciate it. But I shoot... 8,000 to 12,000 rounds a week just in practice after I spent time getting and making a custom round for each of my weapons. Then I give my card to our reload specialist and he takes care of the rest. We give him a primer we want, the brass we want, the powder and charge and the bullet weight. And overall length total he then loads us 12,000 rounds which we take to the range and test fire to make sure this is what we want. And if it is, he will load us 250,000 virgin rounds to hunt with. Anthony, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to give that a look. See, I think I saw a YouTube video about it. It looked pretty decent. Thanks, though, again. Wolfka asks, William, there was a bow hunter killed at the LBL around 92, I believe. His tent was found ripped to shreds. He was killed by a creature. Many have referred to as a dogman. His body was dragged by this creature for a couple of miles and was found. It was reported that several creatures then fed on the body before he was found, meaning there were several dogmen involved. Are you familiar with that case? Were you able to find and kill the culprits? Also, once you recover, will there be a promotion ceremony for you? Yes, I'm very familiar with this case. It was one of mine. It was not a dog man. It also was a werewolf untagged and it acted alone, as in the most famous case where the little girl was missing and found in the tree and my dad killed that giant werewolf there two nights later in the same tree that little girl was in. That is also where I found the bow hunter's body, in that same tree, and I killed the werewolf as he was making his way. I believe to hide in the tree also to be, I can't prove that part. Yes, they will have a ceremony planned for the 29th. I will be out before then, I hope. It doesn't really matter. I got a letter from my wife the other day, and had a nurse read it to me here in the hospital. I knew before she read it what it said. It just hurt the way she said it. I have to stay in shape on account of my job. My wife states that I make her look bad because I'm 60 years old, go shirtless most of the time, and still have six packs that most people would love to have. 22 inch biceps and she's embarrassed to be with me. Yes, I have scars, but I've earned them. So her and the boys have divorced me. Really her. The boys are still talking, but taking care of their mother. 
She says she has met another man who looks 60, acts 60, and doesn't chase monsters for a living, and has committed more time to the military now, so she filed for divorce. Bad SOB83 asks, I've heard William give populations of these creatures, but most of which have been coastal cities and states, so I'm curious if... You could ask William about the Midwest population, St. Louis and St. Charles, Missouri, to be more specific. Well, it's like this. I can no longer give out numbers since I answer to a new CEO. What I can say is you are good to go and walk your dog at night and feel safe about it. Not to say that something could happen, but to say that you are relatively safe most of the time. If you don't mind me asking, what type of accident took you out, sir? Now, before anybody reflects on that statement, he answers to a new CO. Um, he is the CO. He was referring to the three-star general that um, helped in the firing of the corrupt, greedy old CO. Let's not forget that Everybody has to answer to somebody. I mean, yeah, you can say the president doesn't answer to somebody, but yeah, he does. He answers to us. So everybody has somebody they have to answer to. Free Range Alaskan asks, William, hopefully you can say what branch of government is responsible for managing the big three. Also, how many dogman werewolves are near Talk Tina, Alaska? Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, which I know I did. The CIA is who is in charge of these beings till a wartime event would happen. Then they will fall back into the hands of the Marines, who will act as handlers, much as they did in Vietnam. I only hope with better return policy after a mission. As to the number around the area, I can no longer discuss that, since I answer to an 09 Lieutenant General, three-star, he said no more, so that ends that for now till all the hot spots are cleaned up and we go back to normal operating procedures. I can say this, don't get drunk and pass out someplace outdoors. You may just get dragged away. Jason C. asks, Hello, William. I was trying to get info about how many dogmen or werewolves are in Charlotte, North Carolina, especially the Mecklenburg County area. Jason, I can no longer give out those numbers. I am under new command. I can say this if you go walking your dog at night, make sure it's early and keep him on a short leash. Also, I said it like four episodes ago, he cannot answer those questions anymore. The questions, they're, you're just, you're wasting your time now by typing those questions. When the hot spots are all cleaned out, then he'll be able to answer those questions. So right now, if you got questions other than populace, ask away. Curve 57, statement. Thank you, Jeff. Shit is starting to get real here again. We've been out in the woods with my solo stove, so I think I stirred things up, still no direct sighting, just a black mass running away and a very strong odor of piss and wet dog gags the family. Could you give us all an account of what happened when you saw this black mass running away a little while prior to seeing it to a little while after you lost sight of it? Bill, I would like to hear about what was happening while this was going on, please. So Curve57, shoot me out an email um, in regards to what happened. Uh, Bill would like to know. Happy, healthy, wealthy senior statement. I thought that not just anybody could put insurance on a person because of that reason that people can make money off of somebody's death. Just food for thought. As long as that person signs that you can take out a policy and pay the premiums, there is no law to stop them from doing it. What my agent was elite to was if he was forging those papers because it seems he had an awful lot of them and some agents didn't remember signing for him. 
to have a policy. Or let's rephrase that and say the spouse didn't know that he had an insurance on some of his men. My last call before I went home was calling and canceling the remaining seven policies that he did have. Karen Cartwright asks, Would you kindly ask William about the werewolf dogman population in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Minot, North Dakota, and Owings Mills, Maryland? Answer, Okay, so I need to pick one of the three to live the safest inn I got now. Well, after taking a look around the country and the towns giving to me, the safest by far is Owings Mills, Maryland. You can actually go outside after dark there and should feel pretty safe, but things could always change. La Crosse, Wisconsin, do your walking early evening and don't stay out late or stay in a well-lit area. Minute, North Dakota. Just stay in your house after dark, and if you live in the country and you hear something, call the law and let them handle it. Or at least let them try to handle it. Don't go out checking on things that go bump in the night. Best answer I can give you at this time. Hope it helps, and hope the ones you tell this take it to heart. Cat G asks, My question for William. Would it be possible for a werewolf to actually communicate with any human and be cool with them? Not my, not best friends or anything, but communicate and talk with a person and let them go without injury. Yes, they can communicate with anyone they choose to talk to. It's as easy as me walking up to you and starting a conversation. They can do the exact same thing. Only difference is their appearance and your shock of seeing them for the first time. If they return for more than, I would say, two times, they are forming a plan to take you out. It may be 15 meetings later, you let down your guard just a little. You meet him, say, outside in an open garage area, and you offer him something from inside your home. You return to get it and leave the door open. Here is a chance for him to walk in, and your screams will be muted somewhat, and they realize this, so they would use this opportunity to take you out and you would never suspect him to come in because he has never tried this before. Just everyone realize these creatures are taught to live and survive at all costs up to death and they will survive. They will. Steve Riley asks, William, has a satellite been used to watch the big three? Would a stun gun do anything to them when dealing with packs has grenades been used? Remember you telling us it made Sebastian really angry. That's what I use now to track them with is a satellite based, almost like they would use in trucking industries to track the location of their company trucks. Stun guns will only make them mad and you dead. They don't like it and the agent that put it to Sebastian's balls put him on his knees, but also put him at a perfect height to swing his massive arms and claws and took his head right off his shoulders. They've thrown them into packs of dog man and may only take down one. Seems to me they know what they are and can outrun the explosion before it hits them. Yes, all the agents had that night was cattle prods to move him with. And they were not supposed to move him anyway. I was on base, and that was my job to move him from enclosure to enclosure. And I just had not finished my day yet. I told everyone I was going home and eating supper, and I'd be back in about an hour and a half. And it cost five men their lives for not listening to me. Six Foxtrot Statement I heard that a stun gun would just make them angry, and as for grenades, this is just second-hand hearsay by the way. I heard that creatures are so fast they can pretty much outrun the blast radius. I would like to hear William's take on this question. Hey Silver, you don't need me. You have either paid really good attention or not the answer to the question. But yes, you are spot on with your answer to yourself and everyone else as well. Thank you if you learned it from me. Makes me feel like what I am doing is getting out to the right people, after all. And some people 
are taking what I'm saying to heart. Thanks. Every last one of you that has. Carla Kirkpatrick asks, William, have you personally encountered a hellhole, hellhound or cadejo? Are you talking about the creature that is supposed to be like a big shaggy dog, either white for good and black for evil, and has feet like a goat and eyes of fire? If that is correct, yes I have, in Texas, almost in Mexico. I was trailing a Bigfoot and came across a small home in the middle of nowhere and a man, his wife, and I believe six kids living in a one-room home. He told me that I had brought the devil down on him and his family and I explained I would kill this devil and he would no longer be troubled by it. He was talking about one creature and me another and we didn't know it at this time. So as I was getting ready to leave I asked if they had water to fill up my canteen so I would have some till I found more water. He said he would go out and fill it up. He came back inside a couple of minutes without my canteen saying he dropped it but I could tell there was more wrong than he just dropping my canteen. I asked where the well was so I could retrieve my canteen, and I took my rifle with me. Yes, the 458 Winchester. Magnum, that's all I carry when I go after Bigfoot. He tells me I must not go outside. It will kill me, and I tell him that's my plan for the creature and him and his wife start to pray loudly and I hush them down some and proceed outside with no sign of a Bigfoot. Then I spotted what I think were glowing red eyes coming my way, but soon realized they were only three feet off of the ground. I waited till it got around 20 yards away, raised my rifle and blew its head off with one shot. The family came running out and the stench was so bad they had to bury it right away. We couldn't wait for a pickup. I only had pictures of it and its body after I shot it. Melissa Stelly asks, Could you please tell me how many dogmen and werewolf are in Wayne County, Virginia? Melissa, you can go outside and play at night and not have to worry about nightmares. Just remember these creatures are nomadic and numbers can change from season to season, day to day. But enjoy the outdoors, just like you didn't know these creatures existed because they don't want to see you either. That chance encounter with you can cost them their lives, even if they do everything they are supposed to. Busy Mountain asks, William, I believe you said you use FMJ ammo. Can you tell me if copper has any better success on these things? Mountain, I was thinking about the penetration, the copper casing will never get through their bone. You need something that is going to stay together, like armor-piercing round, FMJ. T. Featherston asks, I have a question for William. Would Sebastian or Raphael be considered alphas and recognized by their offspring in the wild? Start this off right. Thank you, sir, for your service to this country of ours. Now we can move forward, a little forward from there, yes. They do, we have tagged females and males to his enclosure and they immediately recognize him as their dad and I don't know how this is their mother can be in with 192 male females and they can pick out their mother as well. The only thing I can think is maybe the smell. I'm just guessing at that. Yes, both these varmints are wandering your land, but not so much that I wouldn't worry about them. I would say something if you needed to worry. Elf Prime asks, William, are there laboratory positions within the organization? I have a research lab experience, an archaeology degree with field experience, and I've been teaching myself veterinary medicine for the last year. What about IT related positions related to wildlife tracking and monitoring? Eventually the GPS and or VF, VHF devices will need to be serviced, and I have software development certifications, JavaScript. I'd even be willing to take an unpaid internship simply to get my foot in the door. First thing you need to do is go back through the videos and watch, and you will see the basics to get into the unit. Then if you qualify, send the resume to Jeff. I don't think he'd mind forwarding it to me. Thanks. 
Claudie McGee asks, I'm sure I am one of many who has less than zero trust and respect for any government. So how do you know that these arseholes haven't figured out William's identity and tagged or bugged him like one of those poor creatures they think they own? What would happen to William if he suddenly disappeared? Well, I stay alert enough that I know what is happening in my surroundings most of the time, except at the hospital when I was put under. Well, if they kill me off, you need to lead the charge to the CIA, Claudia, and get all Jeff's subscribers to follow you. Just joking. They are not going to do anything to me. They want this program to succeed. And for it to succeed means I succeed, which would just be another feather in my cap. Quasar 1113 statement. Thank you to the person who asked about Redstone and the Huntsville area. My dad worked for Redstone from 1961 to 72. He moved us to a really small town in Marshall County. That is where I saw my nightmare. Sure, it was a werewolf. I was very young. Just thanks, it helped me a lot. I'd love to hear your story if you don't care and have the time to send it to Jeff. Thanks in advance, William. Yeah, I would love to hear your story as well if uh, you wouldn't mind sharing it. Um, it may just help. Tom Reardon asks, William, I heard a story of a helicopter turning its searchlight on looking in the forest, a supposed dog man being shot from a team on the ground. When it was found by the helicopter, and the helicopter then lowered a net down, picking up the body, turned the lights back on, and flew off. The dog man was supposedly to kill two cyclists in the Hatchi Wildlife Refuge. Yes, that's a true story. Like I said, we can't go unless we are called into the case unless a death happens, then we go automatically. In this case, we were watching and ready to go almost a month earlier. We had signs that things were going to be bad. They approached a group of Boy Scouts and circled them all night long and did nothing but scare them with their growling, but we were watching them do this. Even the scout leaders reported it to the rangers, and still they sat on their hands and said it was a bear. Two weeks before the attack, two senior gentlemen in a boat saw them in the water wade back into some brush and hide. They didn't even wave back like a human should have, they exclaimed to the law enforcement when they reported it to them. Also, why was they in gila suits? And their sizes were extremely large. And then finally, the whole week before these creatures went on a killing spree of farm and domestic animals, the police were getting calls every day. And the people always said that they didn't hear anything at all. Finally, they crossed the line and killed two cyclists. We still had not been notified of anything happening, and there were six of us in the office, weapons and packs ready to go. It's showing one on the monitor, but we can tell there were more. This is in 1990 in the spring, if I remember correctly, soon after my dad's death. And I'm like fourth or fifth to go out and begging the other agents to let me go if something happens because things are just now starting to fall apart or our CO at the time. Anyway, 0240 hours, it shows that they did in fact cross the line. We got our orders, me and one of the agents loaded on a helicopter and headed that way. We actually landed 10 minutes after they called that morning. They never questioned how we got there so fast or anything. We were picked up in a single black SUV and taken to the scene. Viewed the bodies. One was 20 yards inside the woods from the tents and he looked like he had been killed as to have killed not that many wounds on his body. The other body was 85 yards into the woods and his tracks told me he ran to this location. But he was injured and was bleeding, but not so bad that he could not run. But where he made his last stand, the numbers were against him. There was not hardly anything left of that young man. They fed on him 
What was once a 170-pound man was now a 55-pound bag of bones that could not be identified by looking at him anymore. Later that night, after I had the bodies removed and the park was emptied, me and the other agent started hunting. We found a small draw that they had been coming through and set up to get them in a crossfire. We didn't know how many to expect, but we were there early so we could set our trap. Tony had killed a small hog earlier in the day. We used it for bait if they returned to feed on the bodies. We figured a free meal would be easy for them to stop. It was set and the wait started. Knowing that everyone was out of the park made things easier and knowing all the entrances were being guarded by law enforcement made me feel better. The moon was almost half and all of the critter were making all their noises. It was like, oh, 145 hour, and everything was quiet. They were making a good bit of noise coming our way, and then they started to appear. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I am holding my breath. This is already more than we are supposed to take on, but... They were all so close together, I believe I can get the fourth if Tony gets his three. I'm supposed to shoot the front of the line and work back to the inside, and Tony should start the last and work his way inside. I can see him, and he was moving his head like he's not going to engage in this fight. I think to myself, this is my call. If I start, he will surely start and get his three. So then the lead dogman bends down to the pig that is partially covered with leaves and starts to rise up. I start and the first two are on the ground and Tony has not fired a shot yet. Then I kill the third and finally I hear his rifle turn loose. And I see the very end dogman plow up the ground dead. I shoot again and now I have my fourth on the ground. And then we both shoot at the same time and all seven dogmen are dead within two minutes. Five rounds from my rifle, two from Tony's, and they are all dead in a very small 10 by 20 opening. Called the helicopter and dropped us a net. We spread it out and piled the bodies on, reattached it to the helicopter, and he was gone to the nearest base to get them inside out of view. Terry Tolbert asks, Hey Jeff, as always, love your show. Due to this virus, all I can do with my two grandchildren is take them for walks on the trails of Daniel Boone Forest, part of Levi Jackson State Park, London, Kentucky. Do we have any of the big three around there? We went walking twice last week. I kept having an uneasy feeling. Terry, both parks, especially Daniel Boone, are overrun with both species at this time. Don't go to the park at dark or early morning. And this is still no guarantee, as many as is in both parks at this time. I can't offer any help at this time. I am still in the hospital, and my unit is on a 45-day quarantine. Now, since four show signs. M. Clark asked, So, Mr. William, are you still able to give us a recording of Sebastian's voice and Howell interrupted? William, unless part or all of the 4,000 soldiers were trained as you were, correct? M. Clark, as I said before, I promise to release it just as soon as I have clearance to do so. I have a great audio of him upset, and it continues for almost eight minutes. Then I have a one-sided wrestling match between myself and Sebastian, and you can guess the outcome. Me bruised and bloodied by him. He actually throws me about 20 feet through the air. That's when I quit before I get hurt any worse than I already am. I was talking about an invading force, an enemy of the United States. Zen211 asks, William, do any of the big three hibernate? No, none of the big three hibernate. They are nomadic and move to find a good food source. Today's fourth and final part of the upload is a subscriber encounter. While out finishing up my yard work late one evening, Friday the 28th of October 2016, I became distracted by this weird, persistent, forlorn howl coming from the swamp on the other side of the housing area. Initially, it sounded like a big dog, like a bloodhound. Then I realized that dogs don't have the lung capacity and duration that this thing had because it was coming from a kilometer away. 
It went on and on, then paused as if waiting for a response. That was when I realized that this was something other than a dog. It was a cryptid of a different breed. I quickly ran into the home and drug my wife out to listen to it. She was immediately taken by how unique and scary it sounded and said that she had never heard anything like it before. She quickly became freaked out and went running back inside. As for me, I stayed out and listened to it for as long as it wanted to howl. I even tried to record it with my cell phone, but I was getting the echo from the trees, and that never makes for a good recording. The only thing to which I could compare it would be a seven-foot giant mutated zombie bloodhound dog on steroids. It didn't sound like a homid or primate. It was more canine in nature, like a dog man. After listening to this thing for 50 minutes straight, it finally stopped. This is where the story gets real. A lot of what happens in life that seems unusual is normally attributed to just plain coincidence and is readily forgotten. But I know from experience that a few things that happen in exact succession can usually be tied together to paint a much different picture. I've been aware for a long time that something else is out there in addition to our hybrid hominids, and I have been in the presence of these as well. This swamp from where I heard this creature calling is between two housing developments and is right on the border of Redstone Arsenal on the side of the garrison just across the fence and tucked back into the woods, is a forward operating base, complete with a staging facility, forensic labs, and helicopter landing pads. A night or two immediately following the howl, now early November of 2016, I went into the woods to listen and observe, hoping to record that howler, if it was still in the area, as luck would have it. It, there was a lot of activity that night. At about 20-30 hours, I heard a six-second burst of weapon fire and could see the light from a muzzle flash against the trees. It sounded just like an unexpected meeting engagement with an enemy, where everyone on the team opens fire all at once and then everything goes dead silent once the threat is put down. My sixth sense was pinging and telling me that this was a deliberate effort and somehow this howler was involved. I was also thinking about what else could be flushed out my way as a result of this action and decided to back out quickly. The very next day, I saw two cargo helicopters come in together and landed at that FOB location on RSA. One was a CH-47 Chinook, and the other was a Russian M-18 helicopter and they were clearly not there to support the Army Aviation Redstone Test Center. In my professional opinion, it was very suspicious and intense 72-hour turn of events. What I suspect happened was that someone in the other housing area had either a sighting or a terrifying encounter and reported the howling creature, resulting in a special unit going in and terminating and extraction. I don't think any of this was coincidence, as it sounded way too deliberate. It wasn't until years later, 2020, that I was able to connect with someone that was part of that mission and he confirmed my suspicions. He said I was the luckiest man alive to make it out of that swamp that night because they had killed three aggressive dogmen. So something evil and dangerous was intentionally removed from that swamp that night, and I live to tell about it. All right, guys, I hope you're all having a wonderful birthday of this great country we live in. If you don't live in America, I hope that your guys' day is just as great as everyone else's. Um, I truly appreciate all of you. I appreciate all of your support and it really does matter to me so with that guys please stay safe happy healthy please keep an eye on your loved ones your pets your children the woods are full of these creatures and they are watching our pets children and loved ones god bless